Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and we got a song to dig into today. This one is called Universal Wheels. And, you know, that conjures up so many different possibilities of what it could be. It could be vehicle related. It could be machine related. Uh, for some reason, I'm getting a visual of one of the Terminator movies. There was a giant, uh, huge Terminator, like several stories tall on one wheel. Um, maybe I'm confusing it with Transformers. I don't know. They all look the same to me anymore. However, you don't know where it's going. But the subtitle to this one as our ongoing theme for this album, is Nature's Retaliation, which also conjures up a lot of images. You know, uh, the Earth raining down things on us to cleanse itself or to prevent us from doing more damage to it than we have. Uh, who knows? Who knows where it's going? We will find out. But there is a really long, beautiful intro to this song. So let's just get right to it. Here is Universal Wheels by Uriah Heat. This is a great intro for so many reasons. I love the layers of keyboards that we're hearing here. Uh, it just really creates such an amazing atmosphere, almost kind of a sci-fi thing with uh, the one synth that's coming over the top that we're hearing the delay on and just some really nice sounds laying underneath of that. But we really have no perception of tempo until Trevor comes in with this killer bass line. Uh, very well played, very smooth. And that really starts to give us kind of a perception of the uh, the direction of the song uh, until obviously the guitars come in and everything else, you know, the synths kind of fade out and leave room for the guitar to shine and with a, a great riff there from Mick. And then obviously, you know, we've heard a little bit of uh, cymbals in there, a little bit of tinging on the edges of the cymbals. Uh, just a really, really great environment. I love music like that. If the song had just been that for four minutes or, you know, builds on that, I would have been perfectly happy. But of course... This is a rock band, not a new age band, so we're going to get some rock and roll. Kind of like another earlier song in this album, we've got a great pulse that's being set by the rhythm guitar here and just some really beautiful fill-ins from keyboards. I really like this dynamic that the band is hitting on this album. It feels good. The song feels really big when there's actually not a lot going on as far as technicality, not a lot of layers. It's just very simple and straightforward, but it sounds rich and full because the, A, the sound is great. I mean, just the recording is fantastic on this album. But on top of that, we've got that thick rhythm that's really filling up a lot of that space. And then these really nice colors coming in from Phil, uh, just fantastic. You know, and of course, the rhythm section is rock solid as always.
I love Lee Kerslake's accents here on the drums. I think they're very cool. I like the way he hits and then kind of suspends playing to make you wonder where he's going next to make you really think about when is he going to start playing again? Are we going to go into something different? Uh, just kind of really throws you for a little bit of a loop. And it's so simple to do. That's the beauty of it. I think that if I had anything to say on the overall song from what we've heard so far, I would have to sum it up with there's real beauty and simplicity. We're not hearing anything here that's technically complicated, not a ton of layers, very straightforward, but just sounds big. And I love that. A lot of times if you get a good recording, if it's mixed well, but if you have you know players that really know how to be consistent, you can actually do a lot with a little. And this would be a, a case of beauty and simplicity for sure. Watch, that's going to change now that I said that. There's something particularly interesting about the way Bernie's voice is blending with Phil's synth. It's almost like they're working together because the synth seems to almost swell a little bit around his voice, which I love. I've never heard anything like that before. I don't know if they were using some kind of sidechain compressor to create that or if that's just the way that the frequencies work together. Sometimes just those natural nuances of two things being played at the same time really work together to create kind of a third sound. And I really like that. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but that's got a really interesting feel to it. And then, of course, we're changing directions. Kind of predicted that, um, you know, because, uh, you know, it's like they say in many lines of work I've had over the years, like always be prepared for change, right? Um, I think that really sums up Uriah Heap in a way because they're always doing something different, something unexpected. And, you know, this is a great direction. I'm curious to see where it goes. This song just keeps getting better and better. I love the direction that these last couple parts have taken. Very, very interesting. Unexpected. Have a really good feel to them. Kind of ominous at the same time as really highly enjoyable. I love the blend of sounds. Love the, the thick layers of vocals we've got here. I could be wrong, but I think I'm hearing a little bit of flange or phaser on a couple of those layers. Not all of them, because it would be very obvious if the whole thing was getting... Uh, layer, uh, you know, just pummeled with with flange or phaser, uh, but I'm hearing a little bit of it in there, and I really like that because it's it's kind of subtle. You almost feel it more than you hear it, and that is a very interesting way of you know mixing or recording techniques, and uh, I really like it. And then just of course the direction the music has taken is really cool, very contrast to where we were when we first started. Uh, really digging this. I mean, obviously, this is a song that is a commentary on the state of the world. And thinking back to 1995 and where we are now, I don't really know that we're much further. But I will say that there are some people out there that are making huge differences, especially when it comes to things like sifting trash in the ocean and, and such. Ideas are brilliant, and I'm glad to see people implementing them and trying to make a better world. Uh, but yeah, this is a really cool part. I like the news commentary feel of that, which uh, is very different for the band. They're not so typically cinematic in that way, but that was a nice addition and kind of really drove the point further home. 
I think, of where things were at in 95, sadly, easily applies to today's world in 2021. You know, we got a long way to go. But, you know, with people pointing out that things are bad, that's what motivates people, right? They're not going to fix problems if they don't think that there's a concern to fix them. So I think this is a great idea. I really like that we're hearing different accents in these news reports because it makes it feel like the the truth, which is that it is a global problem and not just, you know, British news reporters reporting on something in Europe or, you know, American news reporters just talking about something that happens in the United States. Uh, it's really showing that it's a global problem. And I think that's a that's a great twist on this. Not to mention that the music is just killer behind it. Nice keyboard solo there. I love that Hammond sound. Got a little bit of distortion, a little bit of grit on that and sounds fantastic. You know, Phil really is such a talented keyboard player. He's a great writer and he has a great feel for music too. Much like Mick, his solos are very much on par with the songs, really just enhance the song that exists instead of playing over it or trying to, you know, show off or do something that's like, hey, look at, you know, this thing I created. Uh, very, very much on par with the song. I think this was a very tasteful and well-fitting solo. You know, I haven't really talked about Bernie so much. I've talked about the lyrics and the content of the story, but not his actual singing. Again, you know, a very powerful performance. I don't think he knows how to do anything less than that. Uh, really feel like everything that he tells, every story he relates to us, he has lived it. He's felt it. And he's telling us with the emotion of the experience. And, you know, since these are all made up stories, I, I've always found that really fascinating when singers are so good that they can make me feel like they experienced it. Uh, on a completely contrasting musical scale, I, I'll mention Reba McIntyre. Now, as far as I know, Reba's only written one song in her life. It's a very touching song. I understand why she wrote it. But when I think about the fact that almost everything that she's sung has been written by someone else, and I think about the heart, the passion, the emotion that she puts into her vocals. I'm really kind of blown away by people who can do that. And Bernie is one of those people. You know, I, I mentioned that with some of the other singers, too, in the band, where I feel like everything that they sing is done from the point of experience. I really love the way that they're leaving these open passages. I feel like 
this song, I, I'm not a huge fan of videos. I really like the idea of music being audio. Um, and even at a concert, you know, I don't mind like video enhancement. But for the songs themselves, I think for the most part, you know, music is is for the ears and not for the eyes. But in a case like this, and I'm not talking about film scoring because that is specifically designed to go with video as are, you know, certain jingles and commercial music and things like that. So I'm, I'm just talking about like the world of rock and roll. And even when MTV came out, I was so excited about it. I got to see a lot of bands I would have never heard of otherwise or may not have really dug into. So there are some benefits to it. But in general, I'm not a huge fan of music videos. In this case, however, I, I really feel like this was almost designed for one. Like they wrote the song and say, put a video to it because there's these nice open passages where the the mind just starts creating things. You know, I'm thinking about that part like right before the guitar solo or previously right before the uh, organ solo. And it's really neat to have those in there because, you know, that really leaves room for a lot of possibilities. And I like that they didn't fill that with an instrument, but still gave those instruments their chance to shine. Killer solo from Mick, no doubt about it. Uh, really felt good. It felt as kind of wild as the story that we're telling. You know, we're talking about a time of chaos, a time of danger, a time of concern and survival and fear and just terror. Uh, I guess all those are the same thing. But uh, but the guitar solo really fi- uh, made me feel that way as well. It fit, but it was also kind of that sense of chaotic panic. The government has declared a state of emergency. The quake, which measured 7.2 on the Richter scale, struck just before 6 this morning. Oh man, I want to know where that guitar playing was going. That was so good. But we're not going to find out because that's the only version of the song we have. Uh, I would love to hear an extended version of this one, though, where we get to hear a little bit more about the craziness that Mick was heading into. Uh, But I really liked what I was hearing. I like the ending of the song, though. I think it's a very powerful ending with that delay on the word disaster. You'll also notice that they talked about things like the city or this earthquake happened, but they don't mention any specific place. They didn't say, you know, a tsunami hit Japan. They didn't say an earthquake in Arkansas. Everything was very generic. And that kind of stuff is designed really to help everyone relate to it. Because if they say an earthquake in Japan, for example, then people in America are really too concerned. They're thinking, wow, yeah, that sucks. But that was way over there. And they don't get that sense of danger. If you speak more universally, and you just say the earthquake happened or the event or the catastrophe or the disaster, uh, uh, the city has declared a state of emergency, that could hit very close to home because you need to know if it's your city, right? And so that was brilliantly written and wonderful performers by whoever did all the voices. I don't know if that was the band and their crew or wives or or who did it, but uh, absolutely fantastic job from everybody. Sounded very much like professional news reports. And uh, very, very well written as far as that generic feeling goes, you know, that sense that, wait a minute, maybe this is my area, maybe I'm in danger. And then, of course, there's those people that refuse to think that anything will ever affect them. And they would probably respond with, oh, wow, that sucks for whoever's going through that. Glad it's not me. And it could be right down the street. So I love this song. I love the concept. You know, guys, I'm not huge on lyrics. We've talked about this many times. But this is one I have to say that from a lyrical and production standpoint, this song really grips me. On top of that, you've got some kick-ass rock and roll music, some great changes, some really dark and brooding emotions in the song, a lot of just that uncertainty within the music, those, those chords and notes that just make you feel unsettled. You know, similar to the way that you would score, let's say, an, uh, you know, a horror movie or maybe one of those weather or natural disaster films. I love those. I don't know why, because they're done so poorly most of the time. Uh, you know, they're just cheap. Knock it out real quick. Let's just depend on the special effects to make it look real. And it doesn't. But for some reason, I really dig them. And this would be a perfect song to be a part of one of those movies. So it's the most cinematic I've really heard the band sound. 
Um, very interesting directions and techniques used in this song. Great solos from both Phil and Mick. Uh, Mick times two. I really wish I could hear more of that last one. Uh, solid drumming, a great bass groove through the whole song. Um, really powerful vocals and so well performed. I mean, this song, it checks all the boxes for me. And being someone who's worked on film scores before, I think I can appreciate it also on that level as well. And maybe that's why I see that a little bit more than some other people might, because that's, you know, part of the focus that I've had for years. And uh, I'm a huge fan of film soundtracks if they're done well. I've reviewed many of them on my show. Well, I've reviewed a few on my show and there will be more coming next year. But very, very good song. Very powerful. I would have to say this this might turn out to be one of my favorite Uriah Heep songs yet. And I don't normally rank things, but this one I think is going to stick with me. I really like it. So thank you guys for joining me. I hope that you have enjoyed the show. I hope you've enjoyed this week of shows. It's been a lot of fun talking about every one of them, discussing all the songs, digging into the greatness of the music. And we will see you guys next week. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Do something fantastic for yourself and do something even better for someone else. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days. <laughs>